Hello and welcome to another episode of the Ancient Warfare Answers um, a series of podcasts. Oh, I almost tricked myself there. This is episode 147. Uh, I'm Jasper Boorthuis. I'm the editor of Ancient Warfare magazine. With me is Mari Dahm. He's the assistant editor. And today, Mari and I are going to be talking about holy wars and whether they're, they require monotheistic religions or not. Mari, what do you think? Ooh. Well... The short answer is no. Um, So Natasha's asked us about pre-biblical. So whether I'm not sure if that means pre-Old Testament, in which case, well, we don't know, uh, but there are some wars over religion in in that earlier period. And of course, wars over religion have become very um, non-PC. And there's been a long movement in historiography to, try and find other reasons for these battles, even though, you know, we have several wars in the ancient uh, Greek and Roman period, which are called sacred wars. They are wars to control sacred spaces and they are wars about religious, uh, what's the word? There are, you know, the the, the most famous one, of course, is the battle uh, of Marathon is meant to be punishing the Athenians for the sacrilegious act of burning Sardis uh, back in the Ionian revolt in 494. Uh, so there are wars about religion that are mono, that are polytheistic before the New Testament of the Bible and also roughly at the same time as some of the books of the Old Testament of the Bible. So in terms of the, the pre-biblical part, yes. In terms of the monotheism part, there are indeed wars over polytheistic religions and even of members of the same religion fighting for control of religious spaces. So uh, there are these wars which are generally with the uh, the Amphictyones, so they're normally leagues of cities that are in control of a particular um, religious space, Delphi being one of the main ones. And of course, other people then come in wanting to defeat the league and take control over the religious space themselves, mostly in the sense of prowess, but also in the sense that you're going to get far more positive uh, Delphic oracles if you're the one who controls Delphi and Delphi knows on which side its bread is buttered, even though they didn't have butter. But so the question uh, is that there are indeed lots of them. Um, So obviously when the Persians then invade uh, Marathon, they are defeated, but then when Xerxes comes back and invades uh, Greece again in 480 BC, 2,500 years ago this year. Uh, so about now, when are we? We're in April. He's gathered his army and he's, he's beginning to think about crossing the Hellespont by now. Uh, and by September, of course, he's at Thermopylae. He defeats the uh, advance guard there. And then he marches on Athens and burns the Acropolis as retribution for the burning of the temple in Sardis. So it's absolutely a tit-for-tat uh, religious war. And in that regard, and again, it's problematic because we see the Persian Wars, the, the Greco-Persian Wars, as for the the freedom of Greece. And uh, we've put a lot of modern weight and even ancient weight on the idea that the Greeks were fighting for Hellas, this, this fictional construct even in the ancient world. And... From the Persian perspective, and some people will argue that this is not true, by burning the Acropolis, the Persians had achieved what they aimed to achieve in this war. Uh, And then, you know, the defeat at Salamis follows, uh, and we then get the Greek version of events that Xerxes then flees back to Persia with his tail between his legs because he's basically lost the war. And the reality is, you know, the Persian Empire hasn't shrunk by any landmass. Uh, yes, he's lost a significant amount of ships and men, but it's the Persian Empire. They can replace those with the click of their fingers. Um, so in a way, we have a very skewed version of it, but religion is a core reason for that war and a core reason for why it gets fought and how it gets fought. And so I suppose in that regard, you know, that's a religious war, but they, they're a constant in both Greek and Roman warfare, this idea of wars of religion. And, you know, when you jump forward to uh, wars, for instance, the conquest of Judea um, in the first century AD, you're dealing with a polytheistic religion 
who is causing offense at a monotheistic religion, but then the monotheistic religion isn't making room for the polytheistic religion. So there's, there's sort of a, they're at odds with one another in terms of their attitude, uh, which, which doesn't end well uh, for Judea uh, with the, you know, the destruction of the temple under, under uh, Vespasian and his son Titus. So there are religious wars throughout this period. Um, you would probably argue that there are minor religious wars as well. You know, we, we hear about the Druids and getting rid of the Druids as being a major cause for an expedition to Britain. And of course, the, the eventual uh, expedition to Anglesey in northwestern Wales to get rid of the Druids. So that's very much a, a kind of a religious pretext, I suppose. Whereas, again, there have been sort of ways of making that not as much of an emphasis as, as it might have been in other periods of time. Um, so, you know, you do get these religious aspects to war that are common in, in all periods of ancient history, but it's something that modern historiography is, in some cases, tended to downplay. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I was, I was thinking that, you know, that the importance of getting religious sanction on any war how important that is in the ancient world. You know, the, the Romans have their concept of, a, of a, a just war, which always requires an explanation you know, before the gods to, to get their permission. In, in, in some respects, just about any war can be argued to be a religious war in the ancient world. Yeah, well, I mean, when you're doing the sacrifices before every single battle and every, every invasion, you know, the gods are approving your actions. So... Uh, you know, and even even in the the pithy statements of generals, what you have, of course, is that when like this, uh, I think Caesar, uh, they do the sacrifice and the animals without a heart, which, you know, that come on, guys, you know, the priest obviously wasn't a fan of what Julius Caesar was planning and took the heart away. Uh, you know what? Um, and then so that the troops wouldn't get, you know, horrified that the, here's a here's a creature without a, an organ to sacrifice. Uh, you know, Caesar's comment is, well, is it surprising that such a barbaric creature is without a heart? And, you know, he wins the crowd over. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, you it's know, just, or, yeah. or, or, or Numa with the with the, the white stag that's following around and giving him advice on, you know, this is what I'm going to do. And, you know, Eumenes and all of these others who've got this religious uh, propaganda machine to approve of what they're doing or pre-approve what they're doing. Um, and I think in a way that's, almost as important as a post uh, conquest propaganda, you know, when Caesar's writing his account of his conquests in a way, his way of making sure that his men are on side with what he's doing in terms of a, a religious uh, approval for what they're up to uh, is just as important than post, uh, you know, making people on getting people on side by writing about it. I was thinking of the Iliad. It's caused by those pesky, Gods. Well, that's yeah, that's a religious war in the yeah. Well, the gods are in the middle of us causing strife, literally. Um, yeah, so so I think that yeah, exactly. Framing war in religious terms, even to the sense that the gods are playing out their own, you know, capricious desires in the middle of our battles. That's something that goes all the way back to to Homer. Uh, so it's everywhere. Religious wars. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Thank you.